I would like to welcome everybody here in the second seminar today, webinar from Onyes Plus Consulting and from our company, Obermott. It's a corporation. We work closely together for a long time now because Onyes Obermott, how she's called now since she got married, um, is the specialist on executive compensation topics. She knows how to design bonus plans, how to set uh, bonus levels and how to help companies talk to shareholders. While uh, we at Obermott, we are really focused on performance measurement. And because COVID uh, made performance measurement such a core topic, we decided we want to um, join forces for a common webinar where we start with uh, Richard, uh, who is from One Post Consulting. So he will um, tell us about uh, market feedback, what's happening out there in the market. And then I will share about how you can measure performance even in difficult times. Uh, most of you know I'm famous for relative performance measurement, the method I developed over the last 20 years. But today I want to go more into the details of how to explain it <laughs> to those that don't want to listen, more or less. Uh, a few things about the seminar. It's going to be about half an hour from Richard uh, on the market environment. It's going to be about half an hour from me. And as we experienced this morning, you know, these times can change when people ask questions or when we move slow and, and we move slower for that purpose. One thing regarding video showing and not showing, please show your video. It helps the speaker when they have tile view. It helps them see you, see your re reactions. So when they get very bored, they know they have to be faster. And uh, but you have to remember that we put this video online because we believe there are a lot of people who cannot come in today. They probably want to watch that at night before they go to sleep <laughs> and be, um, uh, have a better sleep when they know there are solutions in the COVID year. In respect to asking questions, you can ask questions in the chat, but normally my experience is I don't see them because I'm focused on what I have to say. Richard may be the same thing. So what I recommend to do is unmute your microphone and just say, hello, I have a question, and it's okay. And then we are online already. I see your picture, I see, I see your video, and we can talk directly. So this is the brief introduction. Now, Richard, uh, who joins me, or I join him today, because we do that cooperatively, uh, has a lot of experience in executive compensation. He's been working for uh, ABC Consulting, for Arnie's Post Consulting for two years. But before that, he has four years of experience as Willis, uh, Willis Towers Watson and six years with Mercer. But he has even more experience in total. He worked uh, 20 years in the United States and the last couple of years in Switzerland. So he's a, he's a true compensation expert with international experience. And since COVID is international, I guess uh, it's interesting to hear how that international, international perspective works out. Me, I'm not so much the person to talk to about um, uh, the questions you have. I'm really the technical expert. You know, think of me as your IT guy. I make sure your computer runs. I make sure your bonus plan runs and doesn't get screwed up if something like COVID happens. So I'm typically not very much in discussion with my, discussion with my clients because they're very happy that the system works. So I think that's the introduction to us. And... I like to hand over Richard. Uh, the podium is yours. Okay, thank you, Herman. And I will uh, go ahead and share my screen. Thank you. Well, thank you, Herman. And um, as, as Herman uh, mentioned, uh, we thought before we start to talk about company performance uh, in the context of the Corona uh, crisis, if you will. Um, it'd be helpful to provide some background and context in terms of what we see in the market. And um, when I started my focus on executive compensation uh, in corporate governance consulting in the U.S., I was with a, a firm very similar to Agnes. It was a boutique firm uh, that was eventually bought by Willis Towers Watson. And at that time, uh, we experienced the shock of the financial crisis in 2008. And so there are a lot of parallels, um, at least at the beginning, there seem to be a lot of parallels to that crisis in terms of how companies, how their businesses were effective, primarily in the financial services industry, and then how they were responding. And so, so at the very beginning of this, it seemed to have a very familiar feel, but as we can see now, this is a, a different type of uh, animal, if you will. And so, and so as 
quote unquote experts and advisors, in some ways we're learning every day something new just as you are. So we're kind of learning, there's no playbook to work off of in many ways. And so, so just keep that in mind as we go through uh, some of my material here. So um, back in February and uh, the March timeframe, we started to track what I would call some of the market chatter. Um, so this is, you know, the, the virus was starting to break out in Asia, and then uh, there were cases breaking out uh, to our neighbors to the south in Italy. And uh, we were starting to take notice of that at the beginning of the year. And this chatter started to build and we were getting more questions from clients in terms of uh, what we saw out in the market in terms of short time work, remote working, uh, precautions to protect individuals in the workplace. And of course, this started to build. And then eventually, uh, in the middle of March, uh, we had the measures uh, enacted by the government to shut down businesses. And, um, and then shortly thereafter, we started to see the corporate announcements. Uh, so cor companies were starting to announce dividend postponements or cancellations. And then along with that, uh, particularly towards the end of March, I think ABB was the first SMI company to announce uh, compensation measures. So uh, in response to the pandemic, there are going to be adjustments to compensation and particularly lowering compensation for the members of the executive committee. Um, and so as that was uh, developing, then we noticed that ISS and Glass-Lewis, so the two major proxy advisors were weighing in with their views. And I'll, I'll go into more detail on that in a couple of minutes. And so we would take that into consideration and then um, towards the April and May, June timeframe, uh, companies began to formalize their, their uh, responses and uh, they were postponing their share buyback programs. They were adjusting the compensation of the board and executives and be, becoming more detailed in those disclosures. And then also freezing new hire, uh, you know, the, the new hire process was frozen and any potential international transfers. So. So we started to track this data on a daily basis. And, uh, and while we were doing this, this was a little different than the work that we typically do in terms of gathering data in the market. This was not official disclosure information or survey data. This was information that we gleaned from conversations that we were having with clients and then also uh, information that we saw in the media. Um, but then when you look at the statistics uh, at the bottom of the, the page here, we've summarized a little bit of what we, we saw at the time. Really only a quarter of the companies disclosed compensation measures. Um, so only 26% out of the 47 SMI, SMIM companies that we were following. Uh, we suspect that there were probably more, but maybe they just didn't make a formal announcement. So, and then alongside that, we just wanted to see, we were tracking the data in terms of how this compared with short time work, uh, which companies were taking measures measures or announced measures, which is about the same percentage. And then um, companies that were postponing their AGM or going virtual with the AGM. And then companies that were taking measures in terms of postponing or canceling dividends. So, and we continue to track this information, although I have to admit the, the chatter is quieted down a bit. And I think everybody's now just kind of heads down and working through the process. And now that we've kind of crossed over the mid-year, uh, the middle of the calendar year, people are looking ahead to planning for 2021. Okay. Uh, does anyone have any questions or experience from your end uh, that you would like to share? If not, um, uh, I'll go into kind of our views on how we were thinking about, um, thinking about compensation planning and adjustments uh, given the, the, the developments in the business due to the crisis. And um, from our view, we, we decided to go in with a set of principles. So the initial uh, reaction to the, the, the virus had faded, uh, but we were finding that companies continue to face these challenges. It's unprecedented in nature. Um, and then on the same side, uh, executive compensation becomes more uh, scrutinize. So you're facing these challenges, but you also have to deal with increasing scrutinization of executive compensation. And then you're also probably managing talent issues as well. And, um, and then one thing that we found though, is as we move ahead 
and look at compensation programs and to see if there any adjustments need to be made uh, in response is that um, you really need to consider a balanced set of multiple perspectives. So we, in, when I talk about adjustments, I think we really have been looking at primarily adjustments to the short-term incentive programs and long-term incentive programs. And really looking at, at least in the, the first half of the year, looking at the programs that are currently in place and currently in process. And um, when thinking about that, uh, we were advising companies that you have to consider both external and internal views on that. And the external expectations in the market is that any adjustments to these programs would consider all of the stakeholder perspectives. So nobody should be unduly harmed by uh, any adjustments that you make. And then from an internal perspective, you're also balancing the viewpoint from the, the, the views of the executive committee and the challenges that they're facing with their individual businesses, as well as the, um, the workers on the, as we would say, the workers on the shop floor, the, 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 the employees in the organization. So, so this is quite a bit, uh, quite a bit to manage, to keep track of, and all this under the pressure of people are just experiencing stress in their own lives. Um, where they're, they're managing the safety of their families and the, the team members, and then also trying to manage these larger scale issues of uh, executive compensation, corporate, corporate governance. So um, just a couple key points here. So one thing we have determined is we, would, we, we identified of some no-go items, so to speak. So we determined it would not be appropriate to make adjustments um, to, to solely protect payouts for executives, especially if a company is reducing dividends, you're reducing the headcount of the workforce, or you're participating in the Kurzarbeit or the, the short time work program. But we still think that there are some measures that you can take, and particularly when you look at your STI and LTI programs. Um, before I get into that detail, are there any questions or experiences that you would like to share? If not, um, I'll go into more detail on, well, first, before we get into the STI, LTI, talk a little bit about the proxy advisor perspectives. Um, so of course, ISS and Glass-Lewis have weighed in on their opinions on how companies uh, should behave or react in this environment. And I think we were pleasantly surprised that they're, they're fairly balanced and more principles-based and um, they leave a lot of room for discretion. And I think this is partially due to the fact that there are a lot of unknowns between now and the end of the period. So, so ISS takes a more, I think a more detailed view, if you will. So they really comment specifically on actions taken in the STI and LTI programs. And, but they, gen, they tend to be generally supportive if they are convincing, if the measures and adjustments are convincing and they're perceived as fair by shareholders. So, and when evaluating any adjustments made this year, I think they're really going to, they're going to apply the same set of principles that they always do during the normal business cycles. Um, but they're really going to wait till the end of the year, till the 2021 AGM season to really uh, make any evaluations. Um, and then Glass-Lewis has a broader, uh, more general approach. Um, and their view is, is that, um, they will continue to apply their existing methods of evaluation, but they're really looking for quick decision-making and effective decision-making that's done so in cooperation with shareholders. So, and of course, if you have a good track record of corporate governance um, that you've built up over time, those companies will tend to have more leeway or they'll be granted more discretion uh, at the end of the period when evaluating any adjustments they've made to the incentive programs. Um, in our conversations or some of the anecdotal information that we've uh, received um, here in Switzerland, of course, we have some advisors that focus primarily on the Swiss market. So we have ATOS and Inrate, and their views tend to be consistent with what we've seen with the larger international uh, proxy advisors. Okay, so that's just some background as we look ahead into um, making adjustments to the STI and LTI programs or, or the considerations thereof. So 
When we look at the short-term incentive plan, so again, this is the annual bonus programs where you probably have a percentage of the base salary that would be paid out based on achievement of maybe two or three annual uh, objectives. Um, we, we tend to start the conversation by looking at three main areas. So first of all, we're asking, perhaps asking three questions. Do we need or should we adjust the KPIs in the program? So for example, if you're looking at uh, uh, net income and sales are your KPIs for the year, do you need to adjust those targets, um, perhaps lower or raise them depending on the direction of the business? Or do you need to change the weighting? Um, uh, do, you, do you look more into adjusting the targets uh, that have already been set? And you know, do you, do, you um, do that midstream? Or another option is to perhaps shorten the performance period. So you acknowledge that, okay, this is an unusual period. Perhaps we adjust, instead of adjusting the targets, we, we make it a shorter year and, and be done and get ready to reset for next year. So, and again, the, the advice that we've been giving to companies, uh, it, it just follows the set of principles that any adjustments really should be aligned with shareholder interests. Um, if you're going to make adjustments to the KPIs, what we've been finding companies are comfortable in doing is that they are waiting towards the KPIs that are more in tune with the immediate needs of the business uh, for, the, for the time being. So we have a number of companies that look at, maybe they look at profitability and cash flow, or they look at re, a return measure and cash flow. But right now, cash is very important. And so they'll perhaps adjust the weighting gradually, maybe instead of it being 30 uh, to, to support the payout of the bonus, it shifts, we shift it to 50 or 60%. So they're making these, these subtle changes in that respect. Um, but again, uh, and it, it, you really have to kind of feel what works right for your organization. Um, these would only be justified if they accommodate a shift in priorities uh, for the business of the, that, that kind of secure the future of the business of the company. Um, in terms of adjusting targets, uh, we've also looked at broadening the payout corridor, and this is kind of a reasonable approach to um, that's not that intrusive or um, disruptive. Um, and then this just takes into account the additional volatility, and I'm sure Herman will talk about this uh, later in the presentation, but we're really in a more volatile period now, and that would make it, that makes it appropriate to kind of broaden the payout corridor, if you will. So you, you increase the probability that you might be in line for a reasonable payout, given the, the level of stress and the, the, the volatility that you're dealing with as a business. Um, to be honest, we haven't really come across any companies that, have, uh, that are looking to shorten the performance period or maybe buy free or split the performance period into two. I think that they've come to accept, particularly if you're a calendar year, fiscal year, that uh, we just see what we can adjust now. And as we get into August and September, a lot of the eyes are looking forward to 2021 and planning for the next year, as you would normally do this time of year under normal business conditions. Okay. Are there any questions or comments or any experiences uh, people in the audience would like to share? I'll move on then. Uh, wait, 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 wait. wait. <laughs> yeah, okay. Sometimes, sometimes it takes a while. Any questions in respect to adjusting STI, LTI targets? Are there experiences? Has anybody done that? Here in the audience? Looks like nobody has done it, right? Yeah, I, I expect the com I, I suspect the conversations are occurring, uh, but uh, it, you know, our working experience now is just they're kind of ad hoc. We're stop and start, you know, wait and see. Um, but I think they are occurring. So, and I, I I move to the next slide here just to show for the LTI programs, and it's the same type of considerations basically. So. I think the difference with the LTI um, is that uh, the, 
the philosophy of a long-term incentive, the philosophical approaches, this is intended to capture some of the volatility um, you know, of, over a longer period of time. So I think there's a less of an inclination to make any adjustments. And then, uh, but I think uh, companies are looking at, okay, what does our current design look like? And um, do we need to now, maybe this is a bit of a wake up call, things haven't been working as they were in the past. And maybe now in terms of a plan design, uh, maybe we look ahead to 2021 and uh, just revisit the plan as general housekeeping. So, but again, we're not recommending any mid, mid cycle adjustments to targets, you know, to lowering targets, so to speak. Um, I think some of the, the real challenges with the long-term incentive programs is uh, the grant, grant sizes. So some of the companies, if their stock price was adversely affected by the crisis uh, and you have, you, let's say you have a performance share unit program, your conversion price uh, to PSUs from the, the grant value might set up a situation where you have an unusually large number of PSUs that would be granted. And I think companies are looking at that on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, some see it as, well, this is part of the, the philosophy, again, of the long-term incentive program, and you take the wins with the losses. And then others are a little more cautious that this would be perceived as a windfall for the executives uh, if you grant more PSUs than usual, um, and they could maybe benefit more than what would be deemed reasonable due to that adjustment. So. So if there's no questions or comments about the measures that are being taken, um, just a brief um, look ahead. Um, and unfortunately, I don't think we have any additional certainty or uh, within the, the near term. So I think back in March, maybe some of the mindset was, okay, we'll, we'll stick this out for six weeks or maybe a couple of months we'll get the pandemic under control, maybe there will be a second wave, we don't know, but then maybe towards the autumn, we'll be back to business as usual. But it doesn't look like the events are unfolding uh, and, and going in that direction. So we, we kind of have to continue being cautious and, um, and, and talking with our teams about how we move forward and continue to monitor and engage with all stakeholders. So I know that uh, some companies that we work with, they are, they're having special compensation committee meetings, um, particularly to address this topic. If anything, it's just a check-in um, and just to make sure that everything's on track to see if any issues have developed uh, in recent, that the recent period that need to be addressed. But um, I think everybody's cautious and uh, just moving forward in a very practical approach. And then, as I mentioned earlier, then looking ahead, this might be a good time to review the incentive plan design, look at the KPIs, and then determine, you know, maybe there's some adjustments that need to be made if we're going to be entering into a more volatile period, uh, some measures to take in terms of plan design that address that. Okay. Are there any questions or comments? Uh, of course, you can, e you can contact us afterwards to if anything comes up. So maybe a, a short summary from my side, uh, making the, the bonus curve flatter is, is one way of dealing with the crisis that doesn't really require resetting the target. I would agree. Yeah, and that goes along with uh, opening up the corridor. So you're really kind of imposing a lot of uh, neutrality into the, the, you're taking out volatility from the, the payout. Yeah. And that could be justified by pointing towards the much higher volatility now in the market. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Then the second option that um, was discussed by ISS is to um, just close the first half a year, set new targets for the second year. This is something that we have not seen in the market. Even even though that would be a solution. Say like, okay, now we can't use the bonus plan anymore. Let's stop it on June 30th and let's do a new one for the second half. Yeah, we haven't seen that either. Um, and I think part of that is due to the, well, it's a compressed time frame, 
because we're already kind of in it now in that second half. And, um, and the volatility, it's, again, it's the, the predictable, unpredictable nature of what we're looking at. Have you heard of, um, of beneficiaries, of, of, of executives uh, unhappy about the situation? Has anybody heard of that? I mean, you're a compensation expert. Have you been, you know, asked what, what, what's going to happen to your bonus? Have you seen that in the market? Uh, I'm so, so this was a question to everybody. If uh, anybody has seen that um, executives are not content with what they receive, what they're about to receive. If they have come to you and that's like, what are you going to do with a bonus plan? It's not going to work this year. It looks like nobody has heard uh, anything yet. Huh? I would um, say, sorry, uh, who won? This is Marianne speaking. Um, I can maybe share what has happened in our company because we are in uh, closing our year at the end of June, which means I'm paying our bonuses now. And basically the decision was very early on to stick with the current plan, to not adjust any targets, to not also do anything with the formula because we think the plan is you know, robust enough to remunerate for good times and for bad times or, or, or taken, you know, consider the bad times as well. And that's part of it, you know, there's good and bad times. But what we did um, do in our compensation cycle is we allowed um, for a special awards directive to be used in case of hardship cases. And that exclude, excludes, by the way, the EC anyway. And we did um, also consider not granting any LTI this year, but we said, because this is a forward looking instrument, we will um, still use it because we want to retain our people and also motivate them because especially the topics are the ones that had to, you know, maybe invest even more than normally. And for the compensation for you as such, it was more or less a freeze for everybody with, with a few exceptions and structural changes. But on the SDI side, we didn't do any adjustments. Okay. And, and the perception is that is, you know, of course, people suffer from it, but that's uh, part of the deal. Okay. Thank you for sharing. I think for Swiss Re it's the same. I would say on the contrary, uh, of course, no one is happy if the bonus pools are cut, right? It's a bit early to say that already, but I think from the early start, executives have said that this is a wider thing than just Swiss Re. It's a global issue. And of course, there are some losses and that need to be felt by everyone. And I think they early on, they already are, are very realistic, saying that, of course, it, ha it must have an impact. And to the extent what that is currently being discussed, of course, by all companies um, worldwide, I guess. But uh, we have to see how that plays out. Uh, any other vote? I could briefly share what was discussed this morning uh, in the German session. Um, there, uh, we had no, about the same size of people, but um, we had also no one who um, had complaints from beneficiaries uh, in that other session. So it's, it's about the same picture. I asked then, uh, do you expect complaints? And uh, it is expected that maybe in the fourth quarter, uh, it will be raised, you know, once, once it becomes real, you know, that uh, this could become a question because uh, your variable pay is, is an important part of your pay. And um, if you've been successful in the year, but because of the COVID impaired, and because of the COVID, you could not reach your targets anymore, that could then raise questions from uh, executives. That's what was discussed this morning. Anything else to add here? I can, can add from, uh, from Richemont. Uh, one thing that we've noticed as well is, uh, is uh, a need for uh, more clarity and transparency. I think uh, when everything goes well, uh, everybody's happy, but uh, when there is uncertainty about what's going to happen next, then uh, executives want to understand more the, the, the plan that, uh, that impact them. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, yeah, perfect. Um, 
Then I think we move on. Huh? Rich, you're done, and uh, it's basically now my turn. So uh, we've heard a couple of um, solutions from Rich uh, in the first session. And when I talk now about solutions, how you could actually, you know, as Mathieu said, you have managers that have performed really, really well and have a very, very tough environment. This is not really a situation where you could say management um, did a bad job. You can only see, you can only say the results are bad. But you know, if the management does a good job, the results might be less bad than they are if the job would not have been done well. So this is an important distinguish. Uh, a distinction, you know, if you have several segments in your company, some of those segments manage the crisis better than others, you want to discriminate for that. You want to, you want to be able to say this one has done better, this one has done worse. And I'd, I'd like now to look into a couple of solutions, how you could evaluate that. It's really not about the top executives, those that are in the re remuneration report, especially if you have uh, had to go on to payroll protection um, or if there is a difficulty financing compensation, it's, it's a no-go right now to, to pay high salaries to the top management. But the one level below that is not really listed in the compensation report needs solutions, not just for paying them something, also for uh, rewarding or, or like um, for appreciating, for appreciating their performance. And, and for that purpose, we have to look into performance measurement. How could we distinguish good performance from, from bad performance? You need that for, for recognition, of course. You need that for promotional purposes. But you also may want to need that at the Christmas party, where you don't want to just say profits are down. You also want to say who has done well despite the crisis. OK. So uh, we heard two solutions. The first one was you, you adjust the goals. Nobody does that right now. You could, it was done in the credit crisis actually in, in, in Switzerland a lot. You could set new targets, have a rolling forecast that may not be compensation relevant. And then based on the rolling forecast, you could then assess second year performance, second half year performance, or go to quarterly uh, targets as well. This really is more of a theoretical exercise. I mean, theoretically, nothing speaks for a one-year performance period. I mean, it's just as good as a two-year or three-year or a half-year performance period or even a quarterly period. I mean, there's no way of rationally defending any performance period length. So rationally, you could argue that because of the higher volatility, you go to shorter periods of time so that you can still set a re reasonable target and then not much changes like in the last two months, we didn't have much change or even the last three months, then you could say like this still uh, is an applicable uh, bonus period. However, this is only theoretically like that. So when you, when you hear about this, when you hear about quarterly goals or half year goals, you can say like, yes, theoretically you're right, but practically it's not done. It's not really done. And for me, even a one-year performance period, to be honest, from, a, from an economic point of view, is a very short period. And anything that happens within one year is really hard to assess reliably from an economic perspective. So I would actually prefer three or five or even 10-year periods, but then that's not useful for incentive compensation purposes. So one solution that was discussed also by ISS is to measure your performance relative to peers. And this, of course, works in a crisis too. And what I would like to do today, I would like to walk through three examples how relative performance um, turns out with companies that are adverse or even positively affected by the COVID crisis. I'm going to talk about Geberit, the bathroom company. <laughs> you may have, you know, the name probably. Uh, AstraZeneca, the drug maker, and Manpower, a service company that, of course, was very strongly affected. And let me share my screen for that. Good, I think that works, right? Um, so we, we start with um, Geberit. You can see it here on the right, page 14. If you don't see something that I see, just, you know, say stop, and then I'll, I'll try to make that better. 
Uh, what we typically do when we look at relative performance, we show a history. And why, why do we do that? We, we show it because it helps you build trust in that relative performance measurement. So if you would just for Gibber, it just show, you know, half year, first half year 2020, you know, we would probably, um, we would probably have a lot of questions. But if we show them that actually they've been quite in line with whatever happens in their industry, it's a lot easier to defend that relative performance uh, picture. A little hint there when you do this, uh, the most recent year, the current year, is much, much more important than previous years. So you can actually use unadjusted data for the previous years, but for the current year, whenever you want to pay a bonus, you have to make sure all your peer data is well, is well defined, is well adjusted. This graph shows you the peers as a blue line. This is the median of the peers of that peer group. So companies in year 2011, they've been anywhere here. You know, they've grown positively, they've grown ne negatively. The first quarter of all companies are here below the blue shaded area. Then we have the second quarter. So this is from the 25th to the 50th percentile rank. Then we show the, the, the outperformers, you know, they come here from the 50th percentile rank to the 75th, and there's still outliers out here that, you know, performed even better. The beauty of that way of showing relative performance is that it gives you a band, you know, it gives you an area where 50% of all companies are. And that helps you understand which are the good years and which are the bad years. So with Gabe Reed here, talking to your management, you know, the, the, the drop in sales of 5%, which is devastating for these companies, never dropped in sales. Uh, okay, maybe in 2011, but for the last, you know, eight or nine years has not dropped in sales. That drop is actually better than uh, the performances they had here. Even a 5.9% uh, growth, or here, uh, the 2.7 or the 4.5% growth, 4.2% growth are less above the 75th percentile rank than the minus 4.8%. So you see that even though the number here in 2019 was better than first half 2020, first half 2020 is better than 2019 when you measure relative to peers. Now, here you could also think how Gabriel probably has set up their bonus system if sales is important for them. They probably have said from the history that you see here that the target growth rate in 2018 um, or 2019, the target growth rate, based on what they grew in 2018, is probably anywhere in the 5% region. So they, you know, with an absolute sales target, they come to the conclusion 2019 was a bad year while it was not really a bad year. They performed that median. So they did what can be done. And then you go forward from 2019 to 2020, nobody expected sales to drop. So again, they would probably come to the conclusion, this was a very bad year. And if you now have a segment, you know, Rishmo, if you have a house, one of your jewelry houses, and you, you want to compare it to others, you know, what you then do basically is you identify which one has had the least drop compared to peers that are comparable to them. That would be a way of displaying relative performance. And before I go now into you know, several of those charts, I want to ask, are there any question with, questions with this chart? Is anything unclear here that I should explain? Good. So for me, sales growth is an important metric because it's very volatile, always. You, you can look here in the past. 2019, the median was negative. 2013, it was at the zero uh, percent point. And this is just one of many uh, industries. It's in most industries, sales are, are volatile. The next thing that we are looking at typically is uh, APTA, you know, a profit metric that cannot be distorted by investments. And what you see here, when you look at Gabarit, um, which has definitely not reached their sales targets. They have outperformed dramatically in 2020. 
So this is a really good performance. Same, same way of analyzing performance. What we do here, and this is really important, we are looking at how did EBITDA grow? So it's not about your EBITDA margin, you know, divided by sales. This is change of EBITDA to the previous year. So the previous year and then this year, how much did that change? And making that comparable to the peers. Why do we use a growth rate? This is also an important thing in relative performance measurement. Ratios like rho C, RONOA earnings per share are a lot less comparable because they contain a lot of historic information. While growth rate goes from one period to the next. So anything that has been very special in the previous period is probably still special in that period. So the delta, the change from one year to the next, is reliable. And this is also the reason why uh, consumer prices can be measured, because you only measure increase in consumer prices. You don't assess if an apple is expensive. What you do is, is the price of an apple, has the price of an apple grown or not? This is also why we call it indexed performance measurement, because it is an index. Now, in the case of Geberit, uh, the third metric that we typically look at, you cannot do that for a maison at Richemont. You cannot go into a segment of your company. Um, uh, but for on, on the company level, you can also look at total shareholder return. And what you see here is that Geberit has also outperformed on the total shareholder return basis. So they they dropped by 10%, which after growing, you know, in double digits for most of the years, uh, a, uh, a drop in 10% is actually really, really bad. But again, the median is down here at even less, probably around minus 15%. So you can't see that very well here on that graph. I'll show you afterwards the graph where you can see that better. So they're actually outperforming again. So you have at Gebri, three indicators that show a clear outperformance, even though most likely they have not reached their targets. So for me, that would be a case where you say middle management specialists that have worked really hard, they have deserved their compensation. Any comment here? So the interesting thing, of course, are the next companies. Uh, we have AstraZeneca, drug maker, they should profit, right? Well, they not all profited, by the way. So if you look at 2020 and the peer group actually dropped from 2019 in the area of 2% growth to a negative uh, number as well. So the entire pharmaceutical uh, industry has also suffered. It's not just uh, travel agencies and um, hotels, tourist, tourist, uh, touristic uh, in organizations. AstraZeneca has grown less than previous year, but compared to peers, it's pretty much the same. So it's, it's a little bit above median. So you could say like, look, we did what we could, at least we didn't lose market share. If you go into EBITDA growth, it looks very, very good. So despite the difficult times, AstraZeneca has actually improved their profits, which means the management performance was really good. Compare that management performance 2020 to the one from 2018 to 2011, where they lost money every year, like where their EBITDA you know, fell every year, then uh, 2020 is a really good year. Let's, let's look what shareholders say. This is the, the shareholder price index. Um, they are above, it's above median. So if you could to, go to 2020, you're to 3.2% total shareholder return. Of course, it's better than Gabarit. It's a positive shareholder return. Um, they probably profit from the reputation of pharmaceutical companies right now. And uh, also really interesting here, you can see that uh, quite dramatically how volatile total shareholder return is. So um, there's one solution that has been discussed by ISS as well. And this is using your share return as a justification for compensation. So ISS allows you to look at your share price return, especially relatively, and use that as an argument to assess pay for your employees. And that you can do that too. So when you go further down, 
further down the organization to your business segments and your profit centers, you can definitely use your total shareholder return as an idea or an indication how well you've done compared to other companies in your peer set. And that is not that expensive to get, you know, share prices are easily to get. It's a lot more difficult to get like for like uh, adjusted sales data or EBITDA data. So this is a, this is a method again of um, uh, getting prepared. Maybe you look at that uh, by the end of September and you say like, okay, I have the first nine months, shareholder returns, that's where we are absolute since the beginning of the crisis. It's our sales growth since the beginning of the crisis and uh, EBITDA growth and then compare that to peers. This is a way of justifying how well we have done. Especially if you have profit centers that can be looked at differently. Any questions here? So then we go to manpower and poor guys <laughs> without power, honestly. Um, manpower has suffered tremendously. Here we have a situation where they fell 21.6% in their revenues. So a fifth of the company is basically wiped out and that's a uh, bottom quartile performance. So they are now in the lowest quartile. You know, there are 75% companies that are better. You know, 75% companies are up here somewhere. Here you have a tough, you have a tough time explaining that this was a good performance. This morning, someone said, yeah, but it's actually quite obvious because if you look at how they did it in the past, I mean, they have been lowest quartile over, already last year. And then they have been lowest quartile again in 2017, only to recover a little bit to median performance in 2018. And it's true. I mean, it's lower quartile performance in all years except 2014. Being unadjusted, that might, might actually disappear as well. So manpower <laughs> is a company with powerful problems. Um, it's no surprise that they do really bad in a crisis. Um, that's what I would say as an analyst, not knowing the company by looking at relative performance. And this is a big advantage. When you look at relative performance, you don't need to know anything about the company. Because you can uh, uh, Lamont, may I ask, which companies are you comparing to? Or is it the same segment at least, or is it anything? Yes, we, we actually, uh, we actually uh, didn't show the peer group name here. Um, these are custom peer groups. Ah, uh -huh, okay. So basically manpower is compared to any other company in the HR servicing business, in the you know, temporary agency business, then AstraZeneca, which has a whole different index, you know, a lot flatter, um, is compared to pharmaceutical companies. And then um, Geberit is uh, in the construction sector, so they are compared to construction companies. This, of course, is important. I mean, one thing regarding the peer set, which is also uh, uh, something that you need to keep in mind. When you look at growth rates from one period to the next, you can actually be more open with the peers you select. I like to use the automotive example. If you have a company, an automotive supplier that supplies brakes to the auto manufacturers, and you have a company that supplies cylinders to the auto manufacturers, then basically you have two companies with very different, very different business models. Very early when I told this story, I was told if you make brakes, you have a much higher margin than you, when you make cylinders. For some reason, the brakes are more important than the cylinders, which I guess is good. Um, but even though they have very different margins, they have probably a very different level of intellectual property and also a different level of locking because of all the security that brakes have and cylinders have less. Um, they still go through the same cycles. So when less cars are produced, you need proportionally less brakes as you need less cylinders. So when you look at sales growth of a cylinder company and the a company that does brakes, any automotive supplier actually, or here in the terms, in, in the case of Gabarit, any supplier to the construction industry. When you want a new toilet, you may need new windows, new doors, new air conditioning, new elevators. These are all companies that go through very, very similar cycles. So what you can do is you can use companies that are in that, that have the same customers. You can use Hilti, for instance, to compare Gabarit with. You can use 
uh, Schindler, you know, but you can also go into, um, in, in, into other suppliers to the construction industry. That's important because if you want to do the relative performance measurement, you need to keep that in mind. Now let's go on with the manpower. We have the last two slides. Manpower's profit has actually been in the lowest quartile for four, four out of five years. But now in 2020, with the worst performance ever, uh, whole history, they're at median. So when you look at that, you say like, okay, they suffered really hard in the market with their customers, but at least they managed their operation very well. So you have, if you have operational, organizational staff, you can tell them, well, your cost management was outstanding because we managed to be market median. We managed to beat 50% of the company when we actually had sales a lot worse than that. So for me, that would be an indication um, that manpower may be in a turnaround. Without knowing anything about manpower, another client, unfortunately, because they would be perfect, <laughs> they're very cyclical. Um, without knowing anything about manpower, I can say that this looks quite promising. I could then go to my website and look how they're valued because we published that on our website. I could look, look at their value and if their value is low, which it probably is right now, uh, well, the stock price is low, our value rating is high, then this could be a good, a good purchase. Let's look at the stock price. Now, the stock price has been down more than median. So you have a company that manages the performance median, market typical, but has underperformed in sales and has been really hard, punished hardly by shareholders. So the big question is now, how do you turn that into a compensation? Into compensation? How do you make a bonus proposal for somebody who deserves one? For that reason, um, we convert the performance. So you have here, again, the same graph that we had before, but it's now ex a, a sample graph, um, just a constructive graph that we use for educational purposes. What you've seen before is the performance of the company. In this case, it's almost 75th percentile performance. There are two ways you could measure the performance relative. One is as a difference to the median, which we do not recommend. And the second one is you turn that into a percentile rank. Here, 1.8% means 70% of the peers are surpassed. So this is the first step that you have to do. You calculate for every performance, you calculate the percentile rank. And then, of course, you look at the performance of the company as a percentile rank. That's what we've done here. So we've done, we've, we have again here the year 2020, which you may remember from Manpower, they had an underperforming sales growth. It's actually not in the lowest quartile. It's here, probably around the 30th percentile rank, just the same as the total shareholder, the sales growth rank. Huh? Sorry, the, the, the total shareholder return rank is at the same level as the sales growth rank. And the EBITDA rank is not quite median. So when you look at it here in more detail where we spread everything out so that you can see better, they've also underperformed in ABTA. One thing that you, what you can do is you can say like, these are the three points that we're measuring. What is the average? And you kind of have an average performance, which in the case of uh, manpower is uh, still lower quartile, still second quartile performance. One thing that is good about this way of measuring performance for your bonus plans is if you have a couple of metrics that you measure relative to peers, um, the average metric, which we have here as orange line, is a lot less volatile than the individual metrics. You know, they go high up, high down, and the average, the orange line, uh, is kind of smooth. It's always a little bit in the sweet spot. That's, from the 25th to the 75th percentile rank, you can actually justify a bonus. So in most years, even for manpower, you would pay a bonus even though it's less than typical. So typical bonus would be here at the median and they only surpass the median once. 
How do we now convert that to bonus payment? So we have the rank again from the previous graph, uh, the rank of the last year, uh, which was a 70 percentile rank. What we then do is we use a linear bonus function that pays zero bonus when you, you know, beat nobody and pays maximum bonus, in that case, twice bonus um, in, um, in the best case, sorry. So you then can plot it directly. So a 70 percentile rank becomes a 1.4 times target bonus payment. And I've done that now for the following slides. Any questions until here? You, you actually know it a little bit differently. You know it mirrored. So for you, it's more like the performance is down here typically in a bonus plan. And then the, the, the bonus multiple goes up. So it's just a mirroring of the exact same graph to understand that a little bit better. So how does it look now for manpower? When you now look at bonus payments, uh, because they've been performing quite badly uh, over the last years, the bonus payments are not quite at par. So you're not paying target bonus at, at manpower for a performance that constantly is under the market. But it, you also don't pay nothing in 2020. You have shareholder return, EBITDA, and sales growth reason to pay something, even though not 100% of variable pay. For me, that would be a way of justifying a bonus payment without having to use targets that are outdated by now. Gabarit was a true outperformance, has not always been that way. You see here the average rank can also be negative uh, in the lower territory. So Gabarit had their difficulties too. I mean, 2011, 12 were difficult years for uh, Gabarit and then 17 again. But the last couple of years were truly outperforming and Gabarit right now would deserve an outperformance pay, an out, outperformance paying bonus. This morning, actually, <laughs> I uh, I asked if somebody knows how well um, Gebrit performed, and somebody looked it up, and it's actually the case that they're in the newspaper for being for having performed re really well. So they didn't do any payroll protection, and uh, they they don't they're not short of cash. Uh, they're you know managing the crisis quite well. I think they deserve uh, an outperformance bonus. This is my opinion for Gebrit. And if they are not measuring the performance relative to peers, then they are very likely to not receive that. And one thing that I find interesting is you have quite a balanced few on payouts. So you don't have these extreme values where, you know, in a good year, it goes all through the roof. In a bad year, there's nothing. I would think with Gebrit, they're probably paying very little right now. I would assume, based on their targets in, from 2019. Um, and it's also a lot more in line with your gut feel, actually. I mean, when I prepared this presentation, I didn't even look at the news for Gabriel, because I know that in most cases, the relative performance measurement method shows what everybody's talking about anyway. So just typically never happens to me that I have a bad year in the relative performance measurement and people think it was a good year and vice versa, never happens. When you have a relative, because this is because people think relatively, you know, it's impossible to assess any number without comparing it to other numbers. AstraZeneca, our last example, also has an outperformance bonus, also had the situation that they didn't, wouldn't have paid well uh, relatively over many years because their pipeline wasn't strong enough. But right now, they deserve an outperformance bonus, not so much as in 2019, the outperformance of AstraZeneca was even better then. And this is, what? yeah, this is, then the payout 2019 is even better than 2020, but also 2020 would warrant uh, an outperformance bonus. And uh, Mati, I think you definitely have companies probably that do better than others because you have so many different organizations. I'm sure there's there are companies within or maisons within your organization that have um, outperformed the others. And I think this is an important 
information, even if you don't decide to pay bonuses. Maybe it's too tight right now. I understand that. And everybody gets a cut. You know, top management takes less. Uh, and of course, the manager cannot get their bonus either. But differentiating between the different mesons based on relative performance helps at least recognizing and appreciating where performance has been ha has happened. Do you want to say something about you? No? Okay. So, summary. Um, coming to the end, we still are open for questions. Any questions by that point? Ramon, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Um, so how do you, so some of the, the proxy advisors, particularly ISS, they tend to frown on paying out for below median performance. Um, you know, that's a, and I don't personally agree with that. Um, yeah. But how do you think about that or address that? Or? Yeah, it was actually, there's a the little story, you know, Agnes, um, I got really angry at that, at that, at that um, requirement from ISS where they said you can only pay above median. I got really angry and I, I wanted to use it somewhere in, uh, right, in an article. I, I wrote an article on that and I, I wanted to, um, uh, I wanted to uh, write how wrong ISS is by saying you should pay only above median. And I asked Agnes, where did you see that? <laughs> then she actually answered, they skipped it from their regulations. I had to quote an old regulation. <laughs> Which kind of took it took it the point out, you know. I mean, I couldn't make the point in the, in my article because when they refracted again, of course, you know, they realized themselves that this is a stupid requirement. Mm -hmm. I think it makes absolutely no sense to pay only above median because that means you have to compensate for anything below median. So when you say like, I want to give you one hundred on average. And I give you that 100 on average with a bonus curve that only pays out half the time. Then you have to give that person 200. Very simple. So basically, when you ask, when you ask for paying out only above median, it basically means you have to, you're forcing companies to pay, to, to increase their target salaries, which has the only result of making payments a lot more volatile. You don't pay out more, you don't pay out less. You just have a lot more volatility in their payments. And I think volatility in the payments is bad for shareholders and it's bad for managers. For managers, it's bad because if they don't get a bonus, they're, they're devastated. If they get maximum bonus, they expect the same bonus next year. They have to pay higher taxes, you know, because they have a higher marginal tax rate. And for shareholders, it's bad because shareholders hate volatility. So why would you use or promote a future that increases volatility doesn't make sense for shareholders at all. So what I would do today, I would really just counter them and tell them, look, this is, doesn't make sense. You anyway took it out of your regulations. I would not accept it. And this is also why in this presentation, I've shown the, the classic, you know, how you recommend start at zero, go all the way to, to, to um, 200%. And, and then basically for every improvement in performance, you get an improvement in pay. And I think that makes a lot more sense. Any other questions? Good, I wanna summarize. Uh, you'll encounter objections when you measure relative to peers. Um, one, Richard just said, and I answered that. So it's not here, so it's good you said that because I forgot about that. I think most of the questions that you will receive, most of the objections are a lack of understanding. You have to help them understand it better. I do this, and this is all the way down at the presentation on the, on the, the last line. I do this by showing them how they perform relative, relative to peers. They have to calculate the numbers, run the numbers, show them, look, that's how you would perform. And when they see that this makes intuitive sense, then you can convince them using it. So, most of the lack of understanding comes actually from older people, especially people on the board, on the supervisory boards, on the board of directors, because they never, they never needed it. They never needed a relative performance measurement because, you know, forever they kind of went up, you know, in the eighties it went up, in the nineties it went up. It, the recessions were very short, even, you know, the, the 20, the tens and the, you know, or like the zero number, the zero years and the 10 years, they were all really good except for a very short, short period in 2009. 
Um, then they think this is the first. This is the first problem. They have never used it. They have never heard of it, and they have done very well without relative performance measurement because the times were different. The second objection comes: Well, this is not in line with shareholders. Well, I think it is actually. It is in line with shareholders because shareholders actually think relative to peers. Shareholders always assess their investment. Their investment in manpower is assessed compared to other comparable in, uh, investments because they have to be in the service sector. So for them, it's not being in the service sector at all uh, uh, or not at all. Um, it is much more, should we pick, you know, should we pick um, manpower or any of their competitors, you know, they go in Switzerland, for instance. Uh, so they think relative to peers. And on top of them, the shareholders are typically large, large institutions. And these large institutions don't have to feed their family with their salaries. So when you compare managers that actually need the money for living every year to institutional investors, they're really not the same at all. I think they're, they're, they're very, they're also, the institutional investors are also a lot less uh, loyal. You know, they go in and out all the time while the managers, they're with the company until they get fired or until they leave. So I think that the requirement that, you know, um, relative performance or the, the claim that relative performance is not in line with shareholders is for me completely wrong. Then finally, uh, I heard that especially in Germany, Mittelstand, family owned companies, they are setting targets and they want to pay for reaching that target. Let's assume it's a sales target. Let's assume they want to reach 1 billion in sales. When you measure sales flow relative to peers, you're still going to go in the same direction. The only difference is independent of the cycle, you have always the motivation to grow your sales as much as you can. So it's not really different. Relative performance measurement is not different from setting an absolute target. An absolute target is only wrong more often than not, while relative performance is always right. Finally, uh, paying high when profits are low. They don't want, they're worried that they pay a high bonus, like in the case of Geberit, when the performance is actually bad. Geberit is a good case. They have a good performance in a bad year. But it's recognized. It stands in the finance and Wirtschaft. Everybody knows the performance is fantastic. So the situation that you have high pay when everybody thinks the performance is low doesn't exist, honestly. Um, there are a couple of underlying factors. Now, when you really go into talking to your uh, executives about relative performance, some of them will have fear. And, and you should be aware of that because it's a big driver. You have to fear that relative performance makes their business too transparent. And the way they work with that is they say like, oh, the peers are not comparable. So instead of, instead of discussing the result, they're trying to you know, shoot at your method. Um, it is transparent and it's a loss of performance story. The managers, it's also a loss, it's also a gain of control because if you're not exposed to COVID, if you kind of measured COVID neutral, you have a lot more control of, the, of, the, of, of what comes out from your bonus. But seeing the control in relative performance measurement is very difficult for an executive. Uh, uh, typically only, only engineers understand that. And if you talk to someone that comes from sales or marketing, the fear may dominate may actually dominate. And then I have a little one greed. Uh, there are a couple of greedy executives out there. They think they can lowball their targets and say like, okay, I'm gonna do a really low target and then I'm gonna outperform really. I have even a friend who claims to do that. And the interesting thing is he never made a lot of money because people tend to overestimate themselves. And this is actually an important point. When you set absolute targets, they're typically higher than what is realistic. So these are the things you have to cope with when you come in with relative performance measurement in the company. And I cope with that by calculating their performance in the past, calculating the bonus that they would have received exactly with the charts that I've shown today, 
this is how, how I do it. And I think I would like to conclude uh, my presentation here and open the, the room for further discussions. Anything else to add? Actually, I have one more question. Sure, thank you, Rich. Yeah, um, so I was just kind of curious how you view the, the process of building a peer group. Um, so you've, I, my experience has been, like you mentioned earlier, it's really, you view it from the perspective of an investor, right? You're, this is how this particular company would look at the, the, the attractiveness of this particular company versus a universe of other companies, defend, depending on the criteria. But could you maybe speak to like how big a typical peer group is in terms of number of companies and then how often um, a company would revisit the composition of a peer group, performance peer group? Um, a typical peer group size uh, ranges between maybe a dozen peers and maybe 30 peers. I wouldn't go beyond 30. I would also not try to be at the lower end. I feel typically comfortable with about 20 peers to 25 peers. This is where I feel comfortable. Why? Because there are always peers with extraordinary situations. And if you have 25 peers, they, their impact is very low. Actually, what needs to happen for a peer with an extraordinary situation to matter for your relative performance is they have to drop below you without that performance. Otherwise, your rank stays the same. So if they move here above you, or if they move below you, your rank is still the same. So I, I do 20 to 25 peers. And the second question was how often I review that. Um, a lot of M&A happens at the stock exchanges. So you have to look at it every year, more or less. There are peers that drop out, typically one or two peers per year. If you have 20 to 25, maybe one is, maybe one is, is, is typical. Uh, you, know, you know, typically larger companies that we use, they don't drop out that quickly. And then uh, if, you, if you drop beyond 20 peers, you want to you wanna add a couple that, that you find useful that are similar. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Should we close it here? Will be the last opportunity. Then I think I say thank you very much for joining us. And I hope you learned something. <laughs> it was more difficult for us to learn because we didn't get a lot of questions. <laughs> but I enjoyed it very much sharing that with you. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, bye-bye.